fans, wherever you may be. Welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alpstein, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, Seahawks fans, and welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alstead, sitting down with Keith Myers. This is part two of our roster evaluation show. Yes, it is. Uh, we did the offense. Things were bleak. Does it get any better, Keith, on the defensive side of the ball? Questions will be answered. Welcome in, man. Yeah, I mean, questions will be answered. Questions will be asked because... <laughs> That's um, true. Part of the the defense, I think, is a much harder evaluation. Um, the offense, we know what the offense is. We know what Shane Waldron's going to run, and we know what talent the Seahawks don't have on the offense right now, um, and what talent they do. They've got a, they've got a few good players, but there is more holes than 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 answers. Um, the defense, the bigger problem is what's the scheme going to look like. You know, they they seem to be making this this big transition to a three four in terms of their personnel and their coaches. Um, are they actually going to go full three four? Is it going to be um, a hybrid? Is it going to be a multi where there'll be three four on some plays and four three on others? We just don't know what this defense is going to look like, and that makes it harder to evaluate the roster because that guy is that player a defensive end or are they an outside linebacker? Because right. depending on the scheme, they could be either. And I think that that's exactly the way they go into the to the season. I think they do want to run multiple, and I think that they will. And I think that they're probably looking for super athletic guys that can do both, you know, both at the safety position, the linebacker position, and uh, on the defensive line uh, at the defensive line group. They're looking for players that kind of can can be um, scheme diverse. And um, I think we're seeing that initially the way that we've approached free agency and retaining players and so forth. And I think in the draft, it'll kind of prove out that uh, the kind of players that we're looking for, I think they lean three, four, um, and then they scheme around different teams based on the personnel groupings and, and so forth. Um, I, I'm excited, actually. I'm excited to see um, Sean Desai come in, um, Carl Scott, uh, Clint Hurt be the uh, defensive coordinator, Pete Carroll kind of, more hands off this year and just mm-hmm. kind of let this group evolve and put players in a position to be successful, which we haven't seen the last several years. And, um, you know, I'm excited to see guys like Jordan Brooks in this, um, Daryl Taylor, Alton Robinson hasn't had really a fair shot. Leah, um, Jamal Adams in this scheme excites me. Um, I'm a little worried about Jamal Adams and the injury stuff, but Jamal Adams is going to be a good player in this scheme. Quandre Diggs having some help over the top, so he doesn't have to do everything. Mm-hmm. If, if they run some too high stuff, I think Quandre Diggs ends up being a better player just because I think his skill set is not quite elite to be a single high guy, but in where he's sharing responsibilities, I think he's going to end up being a, a really nice um, piece for us. So, and we just we brought back Justin Coleman. So let's talk. That, let's talk. That's let's talk awesome. about this. Yeah. Okay. So let's yeah. talk about the roster. I'll bring it up. I did this for the last show. I made a little um, spreadsheet that that gives us an opportunity to look at the the whole roster. So the defense is on the bottom, in the green and white. And um, I'll share the full screen so you can see better, and you don't have to look at us for a little bit as we talk. And we can just kind of go from left to right, go through the position groups, Keith. Yeah. So let's start at the defensive tackle because the defensive tackle position. Um, is going to be more important um, because if they're going with a 3-4, now you're talking about ha- really having three of these guys on the field all the time instead of two or one um, because they would move you know, defensive ends like Kerry Hyder and Rasheem Green, um, LJ Collier into defensive tackle um, a lot. And you can't really do that in the 3-4. You end up you you got to keep your bigger guys on the field. They've got to eat blocks. They've got to keep the other, everybody clean. Um, and so this becomes a more important uh, position group. And, you know, Puna Ford, Al Woods, Quentin Jefferson came back. That was a good move. Brian Monet, Miles Adams, Jared Hewitt, um, Niall Scott. Really the top four guys are the guys that you're looking at maybe making the roster. Miles uh, Adams is very interesting to me because 
um, as a guy who's 285, I think he's undersized as a defensive tackle, but as a 3-4 defensive end, he's sized uh, you know, appropriately. I think that's a great fit for him. Uh, same with Quentin Jefferson. That's a great spot for him. And then you got you know, Al Woods, Puna Ford, Brian Monet, more, more nose tackle kind of players. Puna Ford can move anywhere. Um, it, it, it's, it's a group that doesn't have that star power, but it is what the Seahawks like truly are looking for as far as their needs on the defensive line. Now, talk to me a little bit about your philosophy. So we went out in free agency and we signed a, a few guys. Quentin Jefferson's coming back. Everyone remembers Quentin Jefferson. We drafted him. He can play the three tech. He's going to push the pocket around a little bit. Might even play defensive end in this uh, new mm-hmm. scheme. Um, Shelby Harris comes over from. Three tech is a defensive end in the scheme. In yeah, three, four. exactly. Right. And then Shelby Harris. Uh, mm-hmm. Is a guy that we picked up uh, from Denver. Uh, Uchenna uh, Nuasu uh, is a guy we uh, grabbed from the Chargers to come in. I'm excited to see what he brings. He's an outside linebacker. I don't believe he's an, a defensive end. Yeah, this. I I I put these groups together loosely, where mm-hmm. the defensive ends and linebackers are kind of yeah. crossing over a little bit. Um, yep. And then, um, yeah. So out of that group, so. Philosophy wise, what are you seeing uh, Seattle taking care of here uh, so far in free agency? And then what do you expect them to do in the draft? Is this, is, are these two groups defined by need at all? Are we still needing players to fill out spots here? Not necessarily, but you can always use an upgrade on your line, right? I mean, you, I mean, um, we've talked about for the last weeks on end. <coughs> Yeah. Drafting a defensive end or edge guy or you know linebacker that can come up and rush the passer yeah, you, and all you that still kind of ha- stuff. You still have to do that because they still need help at outside linebacker and inside linebacker. They, they need linebacker That's help. That's true, linebacker but, help, yes. But but so now instead of you know two defensive tackles and two defensive ends on the field at all times, you've got three defensive linemen that are kind of all very similar in terms of what you need out of them. And you look at you know Ford, Woods, Jefferson, Monet, Adams, Harris – um, and Collier, all kind of guys that fit the mold of what you need. That's a good group of, of guys. With that's remember three are on the field at a time. That's a lot of depth. And um, so it's not a uh, it's not a position of of need, but it doesn't mean you can't upgrade it because some so, of those guys, you know, and then, are getting and old, then your, so. your pure pass rusher guys, Daryl Taylor, Alton Robinson. It seems a little light there. Maybe an edge guy is the is the priority yep. there and, in that group. And yeah, those two and Nawasu. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the edge. That's where the need is. It's the outside linebacker um, in the three, four, that um, is where, it, that's where, where the need is. Um, but you know, you've got, you've got Daryl Taylor and Alton Robinson. Those guys are, are there. You've got um, <coughs> Nawasu. So you kind of have your starters, but you need mm-hmm. more guys. Yeah. Um, and they don't really have. They've got a lot of guys. You know, Jordan Brooks is probably a an interior um, linebacker. Same with Cody Barton. Um, and after that, it's a hot mess. After that, it's a hot mess. It's a whole bunch of nothing. Um, a whole bunch of guys that, if they contribute, it will be on special teams. Yeah, you could the- certainly up upgrade Cody Barton and mm-hmm. then depth. I mean, you could draft two linebackers out of this draft somewhat early. Yeah, um, and that is. So one of the big advantages of switching to the 3-4 is that you need fewer 300 or 280 plus guy, pound guys and you need more fast linebackers. Well that is e- linebackers are easier to find. Um they're cheaper to find and it makes your special teams better because you've got more guys available that have the skill set needed to be good special teamers. So, so we need more we need guys like uh Nuasu and Taylor is what you're saying. Yeah. Guys that can both Rust the passer, but could drop back into coverage if needed. Yep, and those are probably those two are probably going to be your starting outs, um, outside linebackers, um, and that's great. I still think they need someone um, besides Barton as the interior guy next do you, to Brooks. Do you think? Do you think with Brooks, Taylor, and Nuasu on the field that Cody Barton could could potentially be a pretty decent player surrounded by by that group? Oh, I absolutely. I mean, we look look, look what he saw. What we saw the last two games um, of this last year, he played pretty well. Uh, filling in, I agree, for, he for, did for Bobby Wagner. So, I mean, I would like to see that. There's no depth here. There's 
uh, at linebacker, they've got the four starters. That's it. I don't, there's yeah. no one else. There's no one else. Here they really, you, they like Radigan, but they like him more as a special teams guy. They like Tanner Muse. They've kept him on the practice squad last year, retained him again on a futures mm-hmm. deal this year. Aaron Donker had an ACL last year in special teams duty. Ben Burkirvan, who knows? I just, he's not a linebacker in this scheme, mm-hmm. um, but he is a special teams guy. So I'm yep. not, I'm not sure if he makes it out of training camp this year, though, depending on the additions we make in, um, at the draft now the good news is uh the draft is completely loaded with the kind of players that seahawks need they're the linebacker group in the draft this year is fast there is a lot of speed uh at linebacker so i'm if you you, if if there's a year to need a linebacker in the draft this is a good one it really is all right talk to me a little bit about our safety group it seems on paper that we are doing okay with safety but how does the scheme change up how we use safeties uh, going forward, and then maybe talk about the addition uh, of Justin Coleman to the nickel cover uh, well, spot that Ugo Amadi has been kind of holding down. Let's kind of save the, the cornerbacks. Let's talk just about the safeties because they brought back Con- Quandre Diggs. Jamal Adams is still here. One of the things we talked about um, repeatedly over the last year was that the Seahawks had so much, re- so many resources um, in low value positions like safety and linebacker and no, not enough resources and high value positions the defensive line especially pass rushers cornerback um, and it made for a weird like roster development um they just paid quandary digs now their investment in safety is even higher um and and so that's that is it's still weird but it, they're your they're your two starters i think they're gonna go um <coughs> you're gonna see them go three safeties a lot and have where you've got Adams up near the line of scrimmage and two safeties back. Um, one will be Diggs. One will be um, either Marquise Blair if he's ever healthy, um, which we haven't seen him for the last two years. And then Ugo Amadi is the other one. He actually came in and played free safety the last couple of games um, down the, you know, as the season wound down um, and looked pretty good doing it. So he's gonna he's gonna factor in as that that third safety role. Um, Ryan Neal is also there. He's kind of the backup to you know everybody he can also play cornerback he's a team can in, never have a, never have enough guys like ryan neal that can just do a little bit of everything for you and um listening to a little bit of corbin smith what corbin smith has to say he's seemingly hearing that um the team is very high on marquis blair to be able to come back in and have a role here um, as the third primary safety in this group, out of this group, replacing yeah. Ugo Amadi and Ugo Amadi. And I mentioned Justin Coleman a little bit with that cornerback group um, being on the bubble here because um, of Marquise Blair's injury history. I don't know exactly how much weight that has, but that would be a very athletic group. Jamal mm-hmm. Adams, Diggs, and Blair. I would That would just be fantastic if Marquise Blair could figure out a way to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. So when you move over to cornerback, I mean, because Ugo Amadi can fit in that in in this cornerback um, conversation as well. Trey Brown looked good for like three or four games until he hurt his knee. Um, you absolutely want him as a guy um, on your team going forward, but I don't know if he's going to be ready to contribute right away. Um, Artie Burns comes over. I, I think he's there as a starter. Sidney Jones is there as a starter. Justin Coleman is a name that everyone should be familiar with. He was in Seattle for a number of years and a I big think that's deal. a great signing. Justin Coleman is one of the more underrated cornerbacks in the NFL. He's not an outside guy. He's a slot guy, but he's a damn good one. Um, and so because he doesn't play on the outside, people just overlook him. And he just has balled out his entire career he's just a good player i'm a little worried about what he has left in the tank just because of his age and and you know how many teams he's he's been on and that kind of stuff but we'll find that out um i think he's a guy that that has you know if he still is similar to the guy that left um seattle they just got much better at their nickel corner spot um and then after that it's you know john reed who was here last year mike jackson who um, mm-hmm. played at the end of the year when they could not get a cornerback healthy. Uh, Nigel Warrior is another guy that um, played at the end of the year when when they when the cupboard was bare at cornerback because everybody was hurt um, in the defensive backfield. Uh, really, this is a group. There's no number one. There's n- 
a couple of guys like you know Trey Brown and, and Sidney Jones might both be a two or a three as far as like the depth spot. Mm-hmm. Um, Artie Burns, you know, <laughs> who knows what's going to happen there? I, you know, I think that this is one of the spots that they really draft for. Yeah, like one of those well, top three picks that Seahawks have, or four picks in this draft. Yeah, would not surprise me if they go corner. Well, the um, earliest the earliest they've ever drafted a corner under Pete Carroll is the third round with uh, Shaq Griffin. But, but but it's never been this. Uh, the shelves have never been this empty yet under Pete Carroll. I don't believe, except for last year. Uh, well, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. So, um, and, and so I we'll see. Um, I think. I don't see them taking is this a an corner early. Is this an underrated group? I don't think it's an underrated group. I think there's there's some stuff to like, and I think they're going to make life significantly easier on the cornerbacks um, in this new scheme than it was in the old scheme. You're not going to have not these guys. we can get to the quarterback. I'm not, I'm not even talking about that. I think when you have two uh, two safeties back, cause they, you know, playing with three safeties, um, there's going to be more help. You're going to have zones where they're playing cover two and so the cornerbacks don't have to get to the deep third of the field they actually cover the flat um outside by you know near the line of scrimmage and the and the sideline that's their zone area um so they don't have to get all the way back behind everyone um and things like that like i i think they make it easier on the cornerbacks and it just becomes less of a high uh say high value but just you know high difficulty position for them and that's not a bad thing i mean you it's a it's hard to find the type of cornerbacks that you need to be successful in the scheme that seattle used to run um and and so coming in and giving their their corners more help just you can do more with less so so i've uh, for the way i understand it they're going to be running some man and press stuff this year they're going to be doing. I'm not that. seeing a lot of man press corners on this roster. Well, actually, am I, am I, mean, I wrong? I mean, Sidney Jones can come up and hit you a little bit. He's physical, but he's still small, undersized. Trey Brown's physical again, undersized. Artie Burns is supposed to be that cover guy, but I don't know too much about Artie Burns other than he kind of flamed out a little bit already in the league. Yeah. So, where where am I not seeing? Where where am I wrong here? Well, it, it depends on what you, they're asking the guys to do. Um, you know, with Pete Carroll, they're going to be teaching them the kick step version of the press. Um, but you don't have to, um, you don't have to be the big guy who can, you know, clobber someone at the line in order to be a press corner. You need to be able to, um, not let them get a clean release and then turn and run with them and not let them get off of you. Is there anybody on this roster that could hang with DK Medcalf on another roster? Oh, hell no. <laughs> well, that's what I'm talking about. We don't have a guy that can, can match up with somebody else's number one. And there's a heck of a lot of them out there now. Yeah. Guys there's with also- size and speed that we have to face every every week. Now, we can go zone with with those teams just out of necessity, but it'd be nice to have a guy. I think Sidney Jones is probably your most likely guy to come up and, and Six foot, and 199 pounds. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, it, it's... Can you can you not let him get a clean release off the line, and can you stick with them after that? I want Tariq Woolen in the in the worst possible way for this defense. I know because, you do <laughs> because he would be like an amazing guy on this roster. You yeah, know? He, Any, he would anyway. make he would make that cornerback room a lot more interesting. I'll give you yes. that. Yes. Um, I'm my Where, concern, okay, so, and my concern in, out of this whole defense because we you know, we're kind of through all of them. It's um, already my my concern here is. I don't know if Jamal Adams is the guy that the Seahawks traded for because of the injuries the last couple of years and his the misuse of him um, the last couple of years. I, we need to see what this new scheme and what this new brain oh, trust yeah. on defense is going to going to. I actually for him. trust this brain trust more than I trust the old brain trust. How many yeah, times oh, did I just absolutely. say trust? Yeah. You know, it's it's crazy because um, I totally agree with you. Like, I think this whole thing kind of hinges on him, in, in fact. Mm-hmm. Or or they they want another guy to really compete and kind of raise the bar, and they draft the safety in this. It wouldn't surprise me if the, their third safety would be a kind of guy that could eventually replace a Jamal Adams, more of a hybrid guy that could, yep. be, that could pair with Diggs long-term that, that could also come up and play in the box in, in the short term. Um, 
Yeah, Jamal Adams. I you know, if you take a look at Clint Hurt and and Desai and Scott, those guys are brilliant secondary yeah. coaches, Scott and Desai. Jamal Adams has got to be really happy with with the idea that he's going to be in a put in in a position to be successful with those mm-hmm. two guys running the the schemes. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So when you take a look at the whole thing, Keith, uh, I, I want you to do the same thing you do with the offense. Rate rate the, uh, the the defense heading into the draft, and where do you see it likely um, position groups of need as we head into the draft? So I think the defense uh, as a whole is is you know probably B minus um, at this point. I think they need it's just significantly better there's a, than the there's offense. a hint of optimism there, Keith. Well, because I, I think the defense actually doesn't have this huge talent deficit the way the offense does. Um, they need um, they need a linebacker. They need a linebacker who, like Jordan Brooks, is just a commanding presence at linebacker. Whether they be an outside linebacker who just puts pressure on the quarterback just over and over and over again, like like a Channing Tindall or something like that. Yeah, or a. Um, an interior linebacker, someone who can be next to Jordan Brooks and be um, just a. Remember when the okay, go back to the um, the Forty Niners when they were them in Seattle were the the top two teams in the NFC and and competing for you know NFC title games and division titles. Um, that team had ran the three four and they had Navarro Bowman and Patrick Willis and Willis had all the hype and and um, yes. got talked about a lot but Navarro Bowman was the glue that made that defense work. Um yeah, they had good defensive ends and and you know, they had Alden Smith on the outside so, who's a freaking beast, but right. Navarro Bowman was the guy. This is so, a team that needs Navarro Bowman. So talk to me, square this up. Talk to me about the idea of investment and where you invest on your on your team and your players you're just now advocating and you can't just find those guys you got to go get those guys in the draft talk to me about the investment of draft capital in, in that position group um well the only draft capital that that's been invested in the linebacker group is jordan brooks i mean i guess cody barton was a what is a fourth round pick and, and um, now that wagner's not there absolutely correct yeah, and so you've got Jordan Brooks and a little bit with Cody Barton and a whole bunch of nothing. If you go in and you add another second round pick, which is all as far as draft capital, that's what Bobby Wagner was. Um, you add a second round pick at linebacker, uh, you're not creating a spot where you're like, wow, look at all this draft capital we've committed to linebacker. Um, you've got a couple of players, you know you're not paying any of them. Um, it's not a huge investment at linebacker, but it's a it's right now what this team needs. They need to fill out that linebacker room um, and create roles for people so that way uh, they can, you know, in a 3-4, that's going to be the the focal point of your defense. So if you drafted an outside linebacker, rush linebacker, and a middle linebacker for this defense in the top four picks, you would be what? Happy? I wouldn't be I wouldn't be unhappy. I think they need a cornerback first. I would take you've got um uh Nuoso and um Daryl Taylor, Alton Robinson as your kind of your rush ones. Um I think you you get a you get a linebacker, a middle linebacker, someone who can be next to to Jordan Brooks, or you assume that Cody Barton's gonna be there and you draft someone who can who can come in and rush the passer, and then also add a corner. I think you add those two things, I think you make this um this defense significantly deeper and uh, more ready to compete unfortunately they're going to have to hold teams to like 10 points a game if this team is going to want to win so we've all we've talked about the jordan davises and the Perry and Win- winfrey's and so forth how about something like that to help this team oh um you like when we were talking about defensive tackle we we're like hey there you know there's good depth and and you know they're not bad and it's not really the focal point of the three four as much yeah but if you can get either of those guys they instantly make everybody around them better. Just See, because to me is under an underrated situation that we should focus on. Because I do think that investing in the trenches like that is probably where Seattle's going to go with their first pick, whether it's offensive line or defensive line. Yeah, because if you go with Jordan Davis, um, you stick him in the middle um, of that defense. You put um, Puna Ford on one side, Shelby Harris on the other. Um, and that's a damn good front in the for a three four. And you got Woods and Quentin Jefferson rotating. Yeah, um, and you know maybe now Collier, we're talking. 
maybe Collier makes the roster as the um, as the sixth guy or Monet um, or both. The Miles Adams are there too. Um, I mean, you've got you've got a group that you can really work with, and it, you know Perry and Winfrey is the same way. He'll be uh, the five tech in in this particular scheme, but it still leaves you with uh, Ford at the nose and Jefferson at the or um, Harris at the three, and you've got Jefferson mm-hmm. coming in off the bench. Um, you know, as part of the rotation. I mean, this is, either of those guys make that unit even better. Um, do they need a, uh, another defensive lineman? No, they don't have to have one. But damn, they'll be better if they get one. Well, we've um, got eight picks. Those picks are going to go somewhere. And yeah. um, you know, if the team approaches it like best player available, even if it if they reach a little bit on need and go left tackle with their first pick after dropping back, you know, three or four picks, pick up an additional second or third rounder. If drop. they drop back to like twelve, Penning. and then Trevor Penning is there, yeah, I think that's the pick because that's the, the way is, that that the whole draft will then fall correctly. Yeah. I think for Seattle is if they the, do left tackle first. the The biggest hole on this entire roster, except for cor- other than quarterback, which yes. they're not solving in the draft this year. Um, they may want to, but there's not a there's not a draftable quarterback um, that they're where they're going to solve that. The biggest yeah. hole on this roster is left tackle. And if Trevor Penning is still available, you've got to go get that. Or Cross. You know, a lot of mocks have been having Cross drop to them at nine, you know. Yeah. I would, yeah, I'd interesting. Still, I'd still take Penning. I'd take Penning. He's a monster for the for this wide zone scheme that they're wanting to run. I think yep. he'd be excellent. He'd pick up that um, pass protection really pretty quickly, I think, uh, because mm-hmm. he's so athletic. And then he's already a built-in road grader guy oh, for yeah. – for run blocking and it's my goodness he's like the perfect guy i you know i kid you not i've there's there's one pick i've just keep focusing on over and over again when i'm looking at mocks and so forth it's trevor penning it's like i don't know that seahawks could pass on that guy if they trade back and he's there at 12 or 13 14 i think that that's the pick i really do even if like jordan's there or um, a couple other of the, of the pass rushers, um, Johnson and Wyatt, and um, there's a there's a few there that would give them pause. But man, it's really hard to solve the left tackle of the future problem, and yeah, that would so, do it. So I um I I looked at a couple draft simulations, and I was focusing on what if C- the Seahawks don't take Trevor Penning there and instead take Jordan Davis. Um, how does that work out? And the draft just doesn't fall for them as well because. I was stuck looking at okay, do I take an Abraham Lucas in the third round instead right. of and you start instead of instead of waiting because it, uh, because tackle becomes such a need and there's never enough of them where you, the guys can drop and so you end up taking guys that like man I would I'd love to get him in the round four but I got to take him you yeah. know in round three a whole or round two. earlier than or, or drop back a little bit in two and draft yeah. him earlier than you know at round 50 where you know normally you would want uh abraham to go in the 75 range yeah I think teams teams are going to be in com- competition i think he's his value is higher than some of these mock draft boards are indicating so i am worried that uh you know they would reach a little bit for a guy like that but you know it depends on how they evaluate him maybe he's not a reach and we're just kind of falling into the the group think a little bit on him. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard not to be it, because we, we do look at these boards and we look at everyone's evaluations and all of that. So it's hard, it's hard not to, I think, I think he's a guy that looks really good. I think he's, he's played right tackle forever. So yes. even though I think his footwork and his mobility, he looks like he's a left tackle prospect. Um, He's only played right tackle. And so I think he's a guy that you, if you draft him, you're drafting him as a right tackle with the ability to move to left tackle after a year um, and become that guy. But he's not your left tackle week one. Um, but it was really hard to get these draft <laughs> simulations to work out the way Seattle needed them to. If they didn't get a guy like Penning or Cross um, in round one, um, just everything else was you're focused on that tackle position. And so you end up reaching, but that means that you're not in position to get uh, the linebacker that you need or the cornerback that you need yeah. um, in round two. It just, it, it really made the draft much more difficult. It does help to, to use the positional value of nine to drop back a little bit and pick up that additional pick. Cause that additional pick in the third round 
is mm-hmm. valuable. Like it's just valuable. Like there's a lot of players that's probably going to end up being a high rotation guy or a starter potentially um, that Seattle would pick up by dropping back. Now, if you always run the risk, there's other teams out there like Trevor Penning. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they feel comfortable with. I'm not saying that he's the pick. I'm just saying he's on their short list. He just is. There's he's probably be- five or six, six guys in that range that they really like. Um, so they would feel comfortable dropping back. And if he was gone, they'd probably be able to, you know, go up to the, um, to the podium. No problem. But it, I agree with you that it, it does fall a certain way. Okay. Um, l- last question, then we'll get out of here. Out of the group that you see on the bottom, the defensive guys, who among them is going to have a breakout year? Ooh, good question. Um, wow, that's that's a fun one. Um, can can I say Daryl Taylor, or did he have a breakout year as a rookie? Uh, or I guess he wasn't a rookie. Well, let's year, let's year take two, into but... account the the new scheme, new coaching staff, and opportunity. So Alton Robinson comes to mind because right now he's a starting outside linebacker um, opposite Daryl Taylor. And I think that he's a guy that when he was on the field, good things happened. But for some reason, that coaching staff that the CX had last year on the, took him off the field more than they put him on the field. And it just, but then you put him on the field and good things happen. And I, I, I really just don't get wow. any of that um, he, opportunity right now puts him as a starting outside linebacker opposite Daryl Taylor as a wow. pass, and, and a guy coming forward as a pass rusher. And that says breakout player to me. He's a guy that's going to come in, give you seven sacks and, and make a bunch of plays probably have 14 tackles for loss. And um, yeah, he'll be, a, he'll be a favorite uh, after this year. If he gets that opportunity. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I if I'm gonna look just scanning, I'm gonna say if Marquis Blair can stay healthy, he's guy that could really take advantage of the scheme and be a jack of all trades kind of um chess piece for the mm-hmm. defense, just like Jamal Adams is. Um, I think if those two guys are healthy all year, uh, the defense is is a little underrated here. You know, it's it's not I think it's actually improved. Um, to be completely honest with you, from last year, just right now before the draft, and I guarantee we're going to add two high impact players in that draft that are going to come in right away and, and add to it. So it's weird. Think- it's weird. It's weird to hear that because this is a team that has recently cut um, Dunlap and Hyder. They did not bring back Green. Um, lost Bobby Wagner. <laughs> lost Bobby Wagner. Um, they lost um, Reed at, at their best cornerback. Um, and you think they're better despite all of that talent leaving. Well, Quentin Jefferson comes, comes back. I think that's underrated. Shelby Harris, I think is, is a great signing. Um, Uchenna Nuasu is, is a good signing there on the, on the front end. Um, it, it concerns me a little bit at linebacker, but I guarantee they solved that in the draft. And then everything else is okay. The, the, the safety group is great. The, the cornerback group, I think could add a, an infusion there. Um, at least in, in a couple of spots. Um, I'm not sure if Artie Burns ends up making the roster after the draft. We'll see what they do in the draft. Um, but at the, at the worst, we'd, we'd find, you know, our fifth corner, um, to, to come in. So Ugo Amadi to me is a guy that they may end up replacing in the draft. Um, yeah, interesting, fun. I mean, it's a fun show. It's, it's great to speculate. I, I think that um, as we get closer to the draft uh, and free agency is completely done, um, but I don't, I don't see them adding too many more pieces now to the, to the defense. I think the offense could use, obviously, at, at least one tackle before they're done heading into the draft and um, possibly I mean, have, a quarterback prospect. Yeah, they've got to get a quarterback. They've got to get a tackle. They've got to get two tackles on this roster. They need a running back that... Um, you know, could can be that every down guy, or at least first and second down guy, because you can't trust Carson and Penny in that role. Um, the offense just has hole after hole after hole, um, starting with the biggest one, which is quarterback. And yeah. the defense, on the other hand, looks solid. Is it spectacular? No. So does that tell you but that they're going to focus on the offense at the at the draft? Which I, it's such a, 
it's it seems like it's a heavy defensive draft to me as far as the depth but maybe that's where you go pick off some offensive talent yeah i mean we talked about possible. trevor penning starting with tackle yep i mean I, I think you're in a situation where you've got there are certain things you have to get out of the draft you've got to get a tackle um more than anything and you've got to get a running back i think those those are like required um and then after yes. that it's it's who's available you know best um i think that um even two tackles line, or line additional back, guard yeah yeah defensive line linebacker um corner uh they're gonna get defensive players and they're going to get defensive players who are fast uh there's gonna be a lot more speed on this defense they're going to be younger they're going to be hungrier they're going to make more mistakes because they're going to be younger and less experienced and there's no bobby wagner there to clean everything up for them but they're going to be faster significantly faster and i wouldn't say oh let's go we the, the offense is terrible let's go draft a bunch of offensive players because no, you're still going to be terrible <laughs> you're still going to be terrible because you don't have a quarterback yeah, right um so draft the best player and if that's a defensive player fine pete carroll said he wants to win with defense well then go you better go build a damn good defense not an okay defense which i think that right now they're like you know middle of the road league average you know kind of defense you can't be that you've got to if you're going to win without a quarterback with your drew lock or one of the rookies because god forbid any of them actually have to go win you a game because this group looks bad. I think you're, um, I think I think Desmond Ritter's might be the pick. God, I hope not. He's just not good. Um, I'm, seri I'm serious. I think one of the 40 or 41, I if he's there, I think he he's the guy that I think they're probably looking at just because I think he fits exactly what Pete Carroll said he wants. But anyway, that's another discussion. We'll have plenty of those left to go. Um, all right, let's get out of here, Keith. Thanks for the roster evaluation shows back to back, yeah. offense and defense. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You can find Keith on Twitter, at MyersNFL. I'm at NWC Hawk. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube. Um, had a great month of downloads, and it'd uh, be nice to keep that going and be consistent. So until next time, go, go Hawks. Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NWC Hawk. Keith is at Myers NFL, and the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.